Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, we got a full hour of content here, so I'll be quick. Uh, this episode is good for uh, no uh, life insurance credits in BC, good for one life insurance credit in Alberta, and then good for credits in all the other insurance jurisdictions, so Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. It'll be approved for one advocates credit, IAS, um, one financial planning credit from FP Canada, professional development credit from IROC, and financial planning process credit from MFDA. Uh, we'll roll right into the interview here. Uh, you'll see this is sort of a flip. I'll talk to Kent for half an hour, and then he'll interview me for half an hour. And uh, you can see um, I do quite like uh, the opportunity to chat with Kent here. He's got a lot of good stuff to say, and he's grown a business in a way that is quite unconventional. So I hope you enjoy the discussion and I have uh, just some brief comments afterwards. Hi, I'm here today with uh, Kent Tilly, and Kent and I are going to do something a little bit unusual for those who are familiar with the CE Drive podcast. Um, I'm going to start off interviewing Kent, and this will be the first episode of your podcast, Kent, the uh, Kids in the Will, like uh, right. Kids in the Hall, but Kids in the Will. Thanks. Um, I needed some explanation there, so that's cool. And <laughs> um, and so I'm going to interview you for the first half hour. I'm going to interview Kent for the first half hour, and then we're going to flip it around. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the work I've been doing with uh, vulnerable populations on the financial planning side. That's uh, that's good, Kent. That's all. Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And it makes sense that I had to explain the joke to you because you never <laughs> got my jokes in class. Anyways, <laughs> I am not that bright. So that's good. Kent. <laughs> oh, thanks yeah. For, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, so the um, and just so that we can frame this a little bit. Kent is uh, also a stand-up comic, um, which is part of what brought you here kind of a way, is it? in a way, isn't it, Kent? Yeah, my, you know, stand-up comedy has sort of driven my financial planning career, which is really weird to say and think about or hard to explain without me getting into more of the story, but it, it is a big driver of, of my life and, and, uh, happy to talk about how that led into where I'm at now. It's a relevant topic. I, curiously, I just, this in, this episode won't go live until after you and I, after this episode, after this interview, but I just interviewed a fellow who's a compliance officer at one of the big shops. And we talked about outside activities, formerly outside business activities. And I think this was kind of the impetus, wasn't it? You ran into an outside business activity problem at a former employer that I think we can leave nameless. Yeah, and that's fine. If you check my site, you can figure it out or listen to me enough, but it doesn't right. matter. Anybody, any firm would have been the same, and I'm happy I started there. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just started comedy, and then I got hired by, like, the actual branch to do their Christmas party. And I didn't know anything about the business. And that was my first paid comedy gig which is really weird. And then about two years later, I, uh, I was still doing comedy. I really enjoyed it at the time. I was doing like not bad for a comedian in Canada, which doesn't mean much, but, uh, and I was looking for a new career and went and thought, you know, these people looked fancy at this Christmas party. And I kind of thought maybe I'd get into sales and control my destiny a little bit. And, and always knew I needed to know more about money. So that worked. And we had a handshake deal that I could do comedy and continue to do it. 
uh we there was some other things involved in that uh like i couldn't i couldn't swear and be really dirty and couldn't talk about the business and i couldn't talk about the company totally fine i just wanted to still do it as a glorified hobby which is what it is for me where you know a glorified hobby that i get paid a little bit of money for and five years in i went to management training in a town that will remain nameless and and did a uh the guest spot uh which because a friend of mine that's a comedian one of canada's best comedians was in town and i told everybody we needed to see him and head office found out and they gave me an ultimatum and they said you either have to quit comedy or you're fired basically and that was five years in and I had a book and, you know, I was doing pretty well. I was winning their awards and I, but, um, you know, I couldn't do that to myself. So this led to this transition. You sort of said, well, okay, if you're going to make me make this choice, I'm going to choose to have comedy still available. And then you made, I guess, the bold leap into self-employment and really went into a model that was not all that common at the time. So, and I think we're seeing more of it today, but can you talk a little bit about the business model that you now find yourself operating in or maybe what it was then and what it is now? Totally. It's adapted and there's a lot more competition for me in the space, but I, when I was at, a, at the old firm, almost said what it was, I was always like, I need to do videos. I hate cold calling. I hate the traditional methods of prospecting, uh, you know, going out to events. And like, I, I hated being at a party and having to be like, so like, what, what kind of mutual funds do you have? Or who do you work with? Or what? I hated it. And and I'm really bad at it, right? Like, so I was always like, uh, what all it really is, is like, let's teach people, you know, uh, let's help them understand what it is that they need to know and what it is that they don't know. And that should drive clients just because they're asking questions. And so it was like, what's the best form to do this in, especially for me with a performance background, I was like, I'm going to use comedy to drive traffic on YouTube, where I'm teaching people about money. And uh, at that time, also, well, simple was sort of coming into the fold. It's a very easy for me to not sell funds anymore, but tell people they can invest over here, but I can add on a referral fee for my planning services. Uh, and well, simple will invest the money and that's it. And I can charge less because I have way less overhead. It's easy for me to convert. I have way less paperwork, all of these things that until COVID happened, I was one of the very few that could do everything sort of digitally. Um, well, you were using at the time, I guess, well, simple for advisors. And yeah, that's if I'm not that's not it's not available anymore. You just switched off that at some point, Kent. Yeah, not of our own choosing, but yeah, we yeah. we got yeah. pushed off of that. It was a absolutely horrendous transition that uh, put me back probably about two years from where I was. Uh, it was a, it was a nightmare scenario. Yeah, I can see uh, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've heard that from a few others too. I know some others that had made that full transition. And again, you know, we recently had an interview, one that will have aired before this from somebody not using obviously well simple, but using another digital asset manager and sort of talking the merits of that business. But, you know, I always wonder about this, it, you know, how comfortable is it? hitching your wagon to, you know, a service provider like that. And is there anything you can do to mitigate risk on that? <laughs> I didn't have a choice at the time, right? I had to yeah. hitch my wagon to one. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, okay, you're, well, like at the time, that was it. That was the way to do it. So, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm some low level loser, right? That is like, 
nobody knows who I am. And Well Simple was advertising all over the place. People really knew about them. It was an easier sell than to be like, look, I'm going to be your planner and you're also going to invest your money with this company nobody's ever heard of. Um, and they were fantastic for years. Um, all of my clients really liked them. Uh, the customer service was pretty good. During times of like kind of exponential growth there, you could feel that the service sort of fell a little bit during big transitions. Um, now uh, I predominantly use Modern Advisor. I have a few other relationships with some other firms. It was, uh, and the thing about him and Naveed, the guy that started it is we have a really good relationship and I understand, you know, what he's trying to do and he understands what I'm trying to do. And we, we talk quite a bit, whereas, well, simple, I never spoke to the top. That's uh, that's a good distinction, and I think that does sort of tie into this idea of you know, how do you mitigate that risk? Well, build relationships and maybe have more than one uh, relationship out there. So yeah, that's that's good, Ken. Thanks. Well, another thing that I thought was like the uh, you can uh, or you can get too big to fail, right? Because if somebody tries to come in and buy Modern's book, and I. 50% of it is mine. They have to talk to me. Right, right. Well, then, yeah. so there's that too, right? Where, and worst case, if it happens to me again, um, I might predominantly just go back to the fee for just the fee for service model. That was my in, initial intention, but I was like, I, I was worried about, you know, having to continuously get clients every every year every month how would that work i would have made more money in the beginning i'm sure um or get an asset manager that we hire that does it like and you're like listen you're the person that manages all of these clients portfolios under the k4 umbrella and add that to it but i didn't have money for any of the right i just i didn't have yeah. any i had to walk away like clean and I didn't want a lot of my old clients to come with me right off the bat because I had spent five years convincing them that they were going to work with me forever at this place and if I failed then I was like I can't fail you twice it was so hard for me to walk away not from the company but from all of these people that put their trust into me so um I was like you can choose to come later yeah, I can see that challenge. You know, you're right. It's it's very much a relationship business and a trust business. And, you know, I guess there must have been some internal grappling with how you uh, how you deal with those relationships afterwards. Yeah, it was very it, it was a very difficult thing, right? You don't. I, that's the hard part about it is, is the only thing I find hard about this business is the emotion. Right. Um, yeah, you're you're right. The the technical where I live my life mostly right. is uh, is the easy part. So, yeah, I, I know, I and I tried. I was like, well, if I'm teaching you all the time the technical, then you're making the decisions yourself yourself, and it's not me trying to do any convincing. Yeah. So then I'm not the one, and even though I don't touch the money. I'm still seeing like, oh, I got good returns with Kent last year. And it's like, never say that. <laughs> you say, uh, because I don't want to be the one that you came back and said, oh, the, the, I got killed last year with Kent because it's just the market anyway. That's it. Um, so you talk about education and, you know, the first time that I sort of was aware that you had left, I think, was um, from seeing you on YouTube. I yeah, think that was my first indicator. Um, you got out on YouTube pretty early with these uh, sort of snippet-sized financial education videos. Can you talk a little bit about how that worked for you? Was that like an effective client recruiting tool, or was it more like it replaced the conversation at parties about you know what mutual fund are you in? What role did that fill for you, and how's it worked for you since? Well, I kind of want to give you an answer that 
says it doesn't work. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the answer. Like that's, I don't think that it's a no brainer that this is a way to build a business. So oh, yeah. there's a, it's the greatest tool of all time. I don't okay. do anything other than videos. I don't yeah. do any prospecting. And now like if somebody gets to talk to me, then they're like, oh my God, it's Kent. Right. Kent, famous from YouTube. Famous so. from YouTube. Yeah. Um, and so they're coming because you triggered something. In the beginning, it drove a, about 50-50 of like people I knew yeah. and people I didn't know. Uh, and in the beginning, it was harder to get people I didn't know from around the country. And I've talked to you about this before. I started getting a really big following in like Ottawa on YouTube. I don't know what it was with the algorithm or something. And it was probably about 50% of every, every person that emailed was, uh, was from that area, Ottawa, Toronto, somewhere in there. Um, and then when now it, it depends on the focus, but all of my my viewers what is it 77 percent of my viewers are over 55 years old interesting so ontarians and over 55 right so just yeah. just like you right this is exactly i mean yeah. apparently old people like my comedy and young people think it's absolute garbage which <laughs> is kind of kind of true from actually the truth be told it just it makes sense because you start getting near that retirement age and you're like looking and you're like, now I'm taking it very seriously. Yeah. I've been saving my whole life, but I don't know anything. Like, can I do this? What are the things I need to think about? And whereas obviously if you're listening to my voice, I mean, how my comedy works is because it's slow and monotone. I don't have, I can't even talk fast enough to get a TikTok video out. <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, I, but YouTube allows me to elaborate and teach very slowly and say like, uh, I, I'm very interested in making sure people can understand topics that they think are complex, but aren't. This business is not rocket science, but everything about it is made to appear like, you know, there's, there's, it's too complex for the average individual to understand. Uh, corporate tax planning, on the other hand, who fly, yeah. like, get we, out of here, right? We won't go into that, right? Nobody's doing seven minute videos on uh, like the right kind of shareholder agreement or whatever. So yeah, I, right. I, I'm right. with you. But, but that's not your client, right? Like you're not looking for that no. kind of client. You're looking no. for like the average Canadians. Old, yeah. Uh, just trying to get ahead. I always said, I don't care how much money you had in the beginning. I always said, uh, are you trying? Are, are you going to put in some effort? And it was actually like forced people to put in effort because I sent them big giant forms that they had to fill out by themselves. I would never chase them. Yep. Um, and if they got it back, then I would, and I, I told you before we started this, that I did it like the capstone and unfortunately they don't do capstone anymore. Right. Went away in 2019. So yeah. And I miss it. Kent. I thought that was a good course. I think it was very important because I, it, I based K4 on that. I said, imagine if you could get every Canadian to give you every piece of information they have. I'm like, you could improve their situation, even if it was in only a minor way every time. Yeah. And I, I said, you know, do it like that. And I wrote my plans like you had written the, the plan. And then I would have sections and I would move them around. And I, and once the first, you know, templates were done, it became fast. It was like, I can write a full blown, like handwritten computer written financial plan. That's 15 pages in a couple hours. But the first one took me forever. 
right? Like, like the, the you know, yeah, capstone. I mean, those took 100, 120 hours of work. So you took have... me 10. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> I did because I, my old job was exactly like it. And I was like, oh, yeah. this is all that it is, is like moving things around. It was like, you know, I, I literally, it, I was like, I could do this in a minute and everybody else was struggling. And I was like, this is not, I mean, because you'd been doing it. My, yeah, my old job as a quantity surveyor, we, it was like reports identical to that. They all oh, had to cover the same things, but you would just like find what's missing and then change it. And so I was like, because people aren't that much different. You've got a couple with kids, you've got a couple without kids, you've got retirees, you've got, and then each one, you're still including the six areas, but some are more important than others. Yeah, yeah. I guess I and I didn't know about your background as a quantity surveyor. I'm not even sure what that actually means. Who so. is right? I didn't even know. <laughs> was, uh... um, now, one of the things I notice here on YouTube, I I like this a lot. I find that uh, like the comment field is always a minefield, right, with social media. Mm -hmm. um, but I find, and I haven't paid that much attention to it maybe recently, but at least a couple of years ago, you really used to, I think, not be. Uh, shy about the kind of things that you would comment on. Are you still doing that? You're still a pretty free for all with your use of the comment field on YouTube? Depends, sure. I, all right. I'll I'll snap sometimes. Um, but I, I, what do you mean by that? I guess. <laughs> well, I mean when people like people are trolling, and you right. clear, like you know they're trolling, and you'll come back with a I think an appropriate response for a troll. I think sometimes I think. That's I'm fair. happy. To, I'm happy to. I can't stand them. You know, it's funny. I thought I was going to get trolled way more just because, but I think a lot of people will be like, he's like, I don't have anything to say because uh, like it, this is, I'm not teaching opinions most of the time. You know, it's like, I'm just teaching you facts about financial planning. The one time was when I, talked about aurora maybe being like maybe you missed the party on aurora <laughs> and i oh. got trolled to hell yeah and i went back two years later i said how's that working out for you right yeah that's uh, i mean aurora of all things that those comments have not aged well i guess <laughs> right yeah. so yeah. i was like uh and then i mean some people get mad at me and they're like you know like speed it up you piece of garbage and i'm like <laughs> well you can speed it up a lot of people watch the videos with like 1.25 or whatever it's fine right right yeah that's good um so what about then you know now you've got content that's uh gonna be six or seven years old i think that's gonna be mm -hmm. about right yeah. what do you do about uh keeping content updated or you know, like do you go delete old videos and then you know, as we see, like CPP has gone through a lot of changes. these last Right. Years, so, well, I probably should, um, you know, and, and, but the thing is, is so my biggest vid two videos I've ever done were both about CPP. Um, and in total, I think those two have uh, well over 400,000 views. And, um, and, what I thought was, well, all it doesn't matter. And the one that first went was a year and a half old. And then all of a sudden, for no reason, it just started going. And it was the first time I ever went really viral. And I was like, what is happening? Um, I was just getting comments and comments. And, and so that information, those numbers are going to be a little bit off now. But I always thought, well, I can just redo a CPP one identically every single year because you're getting a whole other whack load of people coming into having that conversation so your never-ending cycle of like things where you can just like redo it almost the same thing doesn't matter yeah um and so when you say uh for for example when you say did this work and all I have to tell people is like, if my average video gets 1500 views, 
what that means is that I had 1500 people in, in a seminar with me for free cost me a little bit of money now to get somebody to edit it and whatever, but basically for free, uh, teaching them something. Yeah. Of course it works. Yeah. That's uh, like from that sort of perspective, if you, it's a numbers game, right? If you sort of look at it that way and you know, you can't beat that getting in front of 1500 people at a go. So, and especially those are qualified leads. Those are people who have clicked on your video like they actively went to look for something right yeah they're they're looking for a reason they're trying to learn a lot of people just watch and do their own planning based off of watching me and other people in the space yeah. you now and listening and reading and all of these things and that's great and there are so many people that are like can can you write a plan for me but i love my advisor that I'm paying 30 grand a year to. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, uh, doesn't, isn't that part of their job? Like, you know, so I'm like, no, I won't. Uh, I won't do it. I don't, I will, will not, you know, because I'm my first thing is going to be to tell you guys to leave and stop paying so much money especially I, if you're not getting planning advice. I think back in uh, season three, I want to say it was uh, mid season three, I had um, David Field from Papyrus on, and he actually specializes in doing like second opinion plans. So this is interesting that it's something that you kind of actively avoid. Well, I mean, I'll do it if I think I can steal the client, right? Like, or if I'm like, but I'm not going to just do it to do it chad now who works for me um he does like fee for service planning and a lot of them would be second opinion plans where they still have their money invested but one of my biggest things in there would be like you're paying 2.1 in fees on x amount of dollars and and what you should do is reduce that yeah um, I mean, I think there's something to be said too. A lot of times you don't have to switch advisors to do that. I think sometimes people have just never asked their advisor the kind of uncomfortable question. So, Right. Yeah, it depends who, who you're working with and where. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I mean, the main goal of, of my company was like education um, and very, and, and at the most basic level, uh, as you've said, I'm not out there focusing on small business owners and doctors and, and people with, because to me, it's like, well, listen, I, most doctors are like, I, I want to do something ridiculous. And my friend told me about this. And now I'm just arguing and saying, or you could be super rich with no risk. Right. Like you, you could be perfectly fine and have way more money than you need without worrying about anything. Uh, but I'm not sexy enough. Right. Like, <laughs> and so it shouldn't be sick. This is, should be a boring thing, but people don't yeah. like boring. Yeah. I, so. I do agree with this, like financial planning and investing when it actually shows up in front of the client should be pretty boring. That's hundred percent. Like yeah. you're going to want to fall asleep and I'm perfect for that. Like, <laughs> right. <Nice>. right. <laughs> so, um, so all this, like all your sort of social media work, I think has led you now to this podcast and now you're going to roll out of the guess This will be episode one. And uh, I don't know if you want to flip the tables here and uh, you know, ask me the questions you were going to, we're going to chat about from you know, your, the perspective of, I guess, the uh, kids in the will podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be perfect. And, and it sort of worked out perfectly. So now I, I, my presence, I guess we'll call it, I, I was too overwhelmed with a whole bunch of things with, with the business and, and clients and trying to generate money because the best source of income in the beginning was obviously getting clients. 
uh, now I'm at a point where I personally am not concerned about getting new clients. And it was like, okay, let's really, really focus on uh, education. And, you know, Chad can, and we can build a team of very qualified advisors that can give that planning advice using sort of the same uh, thoughts as nobody's going to be the same, but I would like people to follow a little bit of of my model of thinking, right? You don't have to think exactly like me, but the simple, the just helping guide, right? We're just a guide. And my associate is a fellow comedian. His name's Sean LaCombre. He's absolutely hilarious, but comedians got killed in COVID and he helps me with sort of writing and other things. And, and he applied for a TELUS podcast grant which we got uh and the focus was going to be that we want to help people that are really struggling with money learn where they can go for help and and all of the things that they can do and the thing about my background is that i'm generally not dealing with people in that situation i have a pretty good understanding of you know, CPP disability and, and, you know, insurance and a little bit in debt consolidation and, and good understanding of GIS, but I'm not, you know, as you know, Jason, the money in this business is not in low income clients, Yeah. but COVID stresses me out more than anything and knowing that how many people are hurting because of covid and now inflation and now the cost of housing and all of these other things and i just see this getting worse and worse and i was like what can we do to help and the first person i knew i needed to come to was you because for one if you don't know who jason is which you do if you've listened to his podcast but he is and in my opinion the absolute best financial educator in the country and has taught almost every single one of us uh, to be that much better. And anybody that's ever learned or got their CFP designation because he taught them is better than their peers, in my opinion. So I was like, Jason, what do I do? Who do I talk to? And uh, that's where you come in. That's more intro than I deserve, Ken, but I appreciate it. Thanks. That's nice. Um, yeah, and I would think that like, when I saw this, when I saw the goal here to produce good content that dealt with that working with vulnerable populations, um, and I've been lucky here because I have been able to meet a bunch of people who work in that space. So you know, I sent Sean a list of maybe eight or 10 people to reach out to, and I, I hope that there's a good material for you that to work with. There's certainly, um, you know, like I, I think like a lot of other things, I'm pretty good from a generalist perspective but what I find is a lot of times when you get into this specific problem, you need like that right person to, right. to deal with this. So, um, you know, for me, I came into the space, you know, much like you're coming into it today. I came in in, I want to say 2016, um, really knowing nothing about working with vulnerable populations. And uh, I learned early, I had a really good nonprofit that I was working with, an organization here at Edmonton called CEASE, which is a center to end all sexual exploitation. And I had no idea um, how fortunate I was at the time, but they sort of had, um, and it's a different person now, but still they have the role filled. They had one person who was, CEASE is a very um, hands-on um, support agency. Like when you're going through they have kind of a person to handle every kind of struggle. So if you're having, if you're dealing with an addictions issue, they have like an addictions person attached to you. If you're dealing with victim services, they have like a victim services person attached to you. And they had somebody who was sort of their financial empowerment person. Um, she's not working in the city of Edmonton's financial empowerment department, but um, but you know she was very connected to her constituents. And so I got, I was lucky. I got to work with people who had somebody who really cared about their outcomes and right which and, is and so important right especially it, in that space right like yeah it it really is um and no i was lucky i as well in that i i was sort of welcomed by this organization that really had no reason to 
welcome me, right? We had, you know, I always think about my first meeting with the staff there. Um, they were very concerned about um, like client confidentiality and sensitivity around you know, dealing with like people who are emerging from human trafficking, people who had been in addictions or in the court system or whatever. Um, so I met the first time I met the executive director off site. Um, you know, she like didn't want to give away the office location. And this is like they don't have a big sign up on their window that says this is who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a meeting off site and kind of explained to her what I was looking to do. And then uh, met with the whole staff. It was a very intimidating meeting too. You know, it was it's all these uh, these ladies who were very used to dealing with people in these you know tough situations. Um, and we like what's financial planning? They kind of you know a lot of them come at it with this assumption, and I, I know you deal with this too, of uh, you're going to help somebody to deal with their um, like their investments, and these, like these right. people have no money to invest, right? I had to say no, no, like kind of like we just talked about investing is the the most boring part for me there's a thousand other things that we can talk about in a financial planning discussion so right i exactly but everybody wants to talk about the investing so that's the hard part and you're like well no yeah. the plan starts well before investing even comes into play and then that's the easy part but so i and and so what were you what how did you even know like what do you do when you get in there and how do you even begin to think about helping somebody in a situation like that from so, our perspective yeah so there was an um and i don't know where it started i think i want to say it might have been carol lind at bridge house which is a mutual fund manager out of toronto um there was some folks in toronto who had previously done something called um m power like capital m and then the word power which is different from what we do in Edmonton, which is empower you, which is like empower right. and then the letter U. Um, and in empower, they had worked with people in the Toronto public housing system. And they had done this kind of pilot project where they paired up financial planners with folks in that public housing system. Mm -hmm. And I think there were some lessons learned there, some tough lessons learned, but they distilled some of that down into a webinar. So, you know, honestly, my training here was I sat in on a one hour webinar, maybe two hours um, with maybe three or four financial planners who had done that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And they talked about, um, you know, a credit score as a kind of starting point. And I believe that's where I got this from. So what I started doing when I first started meeting with the CEAS participants. Oh, and that was the other thing too. They had had an accountant who had been doing a little bit of this kind of work before, um, but she was more focused on tax returns. There's a whole complicated issue um, with tax returns because um, you know there's the uh, Canada Revenue Agency runs low income tax preparation clinics. Um, okay. This, this, by the way, is a great, um, like if you're looking to get into the, the low income planning space, this is an easier foot in the door than what I've done. Um, right, right. But the problem with those low income tax preparation clinics is you can't deal with self-employment income there because as you know, self-employment income is so much more complicated. Um, mm -hmm. And at CEASE, you know, these are all people leaving the sex trade. Uh, all the income is self-employment income. Right. So, you know, you want to file a tax return to get your Canada pension plan squared away or, you know, to qualify for like a city of Edmonton, you know, low income transit pass or something like that. You can't do it, right? It's just mm -hmm. not available. So anyways, they'd had a lady there who had helped out with tax returns and she had often looked at people's credit scores. So that's what I decided to do too. And I, I think it came from both places. So I sat down, first thing I would do, we would log into Credit Karma. And I know there's like Credit Karma is not a great, like there's a bunch of problems with it, but I would caution people about it. We would sort of go through the pros and cons of Credit Karma. And then we would create a Credit Karma account and, and now there's better ways to do this, but five years ago, that was the way to get a free credit report. Okay. So, yeah, so you would log in there and we would just go through it. We would say, okay, what's your credit score? What does it mean? We would look at what stuff that person had in collections. There's always, always stuff in collections. Um, and, and often it was just a sense of relief for people. There, there were sort of two things that were happening here. Um, first off, I would always go in a jacket and tie. I know I'm not wearing a jacket and tie today, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, in face-to-face -face meetings, they said like, here's a guy who 
you know, shows up. He, he looks like, you know, my vision of a financial planner. Um, right. I wouldn't necessarily wear a jacket and tie with every client, like if I was a financial planner, but in this case, it was a deliberate choice, right? Mm -hmm. say. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and they would sort of say, here's somebody who, you know, clearly takes himself somewhat seriously, right? Which again, that's a mixed bag, but whatever. Right. Um, and he's sitting, helping me out. Right. So just that feeling like you've got somebody on your side, as opposed to, I think for a lot of the vulnerable population folks that we deal with, when they see somebody in jacket and tie, that's somebody who's going to take advantage of them or that kind of thing. I just wanted to show that, you know, that it, this can be somebody on your side. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that happens is just by going through that, you know, it's like a lot of things you shed a little light on it, create a little more awareness. And that person now just feels better about their situation. Like no shame, no embarrassment. We just go through, okay, what's this debt? Where does it come from? What, you know, what are we going to do to deal with it? And it very sort of problem solving oriented. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we can solve a ton of problems. These were, you know, typically like 20 minute or half hour meetings, at least initially. So it would be, you know, a very, very abbreviated financial plan. I, I always try to do three action steps. What are three things you can do in the next month to, uh, to improve your financial situation, much like you talked about before, right? Just put something concrete in front of somebody that they can do to improve their financial situation. Right. And I mean, I think too, if you're getting into too many things and you say, okay, you've got to do these 18 steps, it's too overwhelming. You don't do any of them. But if there's one or two and you have an actual plan to do it. And that was, that is always the case. So I, you know, I, I don't want to go back to the beginning of the thing too much, but I always thought, oh, from this, I'm going to get, you know, thousands of potential clients with like 20 grand that have never gotten any help or have some debt and whatever. And I was happy to help them. And none of that happened. The average client that I got when I started was four times the size of the average client I got previously. And it's, and it's always because people feel ashamed or something about their financial situation. But I try and make it very clear, like money is not easy. Uh, there are so many people that are just in facing financial difficulty or have credit card debt or have these things or just struggle to sleep at night because they can't pay their bills. And, and we all know that. Um, so you know, the first thing to do is to talk about it just with even with, you know, your own mental health stuff that, you know, everybody has their own issues. Well, the best thing to do is to start talking about it uh, instead of holding it in. Yeah, 100%. And this shame response, it's a tough thing to deal with. Um, and really, it's not something that I've ever, I think, talked about openly with any clients. I have to think if it's something anybody ever brought up, but it seems like in our meetings, it's been something where, you know, you meet with that person and you ask them some genuinely curious, open-ended questions, just give them a chance to talk a little bit. And we roll into whatever financial discussion we're going to have. Um, I, I don't think that I've seen it where once you actually get past that first barrier, where that shame response shows up anymore. But I agree with you that it stops mm -hmm. people from even having that initial engagement. So. Just, yeah, just from starting. I, I agree with once it once it happens, it's like, yeah. And because we've seen it before, we know, right? So it's like, okay, it's, it's not like, uh, not that, I mean, I'm dealing with quite the same space, but I, of course, I've seen people in, in, trouble financially of course i've talked to people that had to go bankrupt of course i've you know seen businesses fail and all of these other things so um just uh interesting so from there do you continue to meet with them or so most so this is where you run into a little bit of a challenge and this is where i always wonder about this so i i i didn't keep great statistics around this i was never um you know i was kind of focused on doing the work but, you know, like a lot of agencies, they rely on um, uh, donated money or grants, that kind of thing. So they keep good statistics to sort of go and show donors. 
So I know in my first three years there, I met with 98 people and 13 of them had follow on appointments. Um, and, you know, so I said like that other 85 people, I know that some of them like went back into the business. I know that some of them had other issues to deal with. And this is something that we have to come to terms with doing this kind of work. I think this is the biggest challenge um, that and I have a, a sort of team of people doing this work with me now, but this is the thing that I always have to coach people on, like the advisors that we bring in, is you figure you're going to meet with you know, 98 people and 98 people are going to have you know, notably positive outcomes that you're going to be a part of. And you don't necessarily get to see that. So some of those right. folks I know, you know, I gave my three action plan list and some of them wouldn't have got away and done, done them on their own and we would have had no follow on. And if that happens, that's fine. Some of them would have taken that three item list and maybe had best of intentions around it, but never gotten around to it. But I also think at least they got the opportunity to see that there's somebody who cares about their financial outcomes. So mm -hmm. it's a problem worth solving. And then you have this sort of Maslow's uh, pyramid problem where a good chunk of those folks were still or are still dealing with really more like safety and security type of issues. So I met with plenty of people who were either still in the penal system or still in addictions, right? So mm -hmm. still in like uh, addictions treatment facilities. And I always thought like, it's good, you know, you stand and meet with this person, we talk about financial matters, but you've got way more, and I would never, you know, tell this to somebody unless really like it was something they broached and then we could talk about it a little bit, but mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a counselor. I'm not anything like that. Um, they had whole other like, you know, right. framework set up for that kind of thing. But I know that that person is going to have to go back and and sort out whatever is going on on the addiction side or the mental health side or the whatever the prison system is doing with them. Like that's, you know, when you have that kind of stuff going on, who really cares if you've got you know excessive debt or if you're accruing interest or if a collections agent is bothering you? Like, you know. You have to be real about how important money is in people's lives. And yes, it, it's something that, you know, it can make everybody's life better, but you're not going to deal with those issues when that other stuff is happening. And I think that's, that can be a hard thing to come to terms with, right? Where you say, like, I've sat down with this person and I'm really expecting great outcomes and you're not always going to get it. So. No, of course, of course not. Right. It's the, it's a very challenging situation just on the money side. Yeah. let alone you throw in all of the other factors. So you have to know that it's not not going to work most of the time, unfortunately, which is sad, right? Because you can only try to help. And that's sort of, I think, a reason why a lot of people wouldn't get into this space too, is because, but so then would you go into consumer proposal? Because of what I worry about in this space is, profiteering right like what? yeah i get that um and i think that's a fair comment um so there is an organization that does like so they go th the folks that i meet with have done a sort of 10 or 12 week financial literacy package it depends on the organization they're working with but it's 10 or 12 weeks of sort of regular two-hour sessions and mm -hmm. one of the sessions they do in there is with a credit counselor somebody who does consumer proposals so they've talked about it already once Okay. Um, I have rarely seen where like, I find almost all the folks I dealt with um, preferred to work their way out of their debt. Um, so where there was a consumer proposal needed, it wasn't that common. I think maybe I sent one person to go do consumer proposal in the time I was working with folks. And I don't know if she did, but um, in the time I was working in that agency, anyways, I still do this work. I don't want to sound like I'm not doing this work anymore. Right. Um, but in this time, I think I've sent one person to consumer proposal. And yeah, I mean, the way that that works, you have to charge for it. You can't actually, as far as I know, anyways, a consumer proposal, like a licensed insolvency trustee, can't do that work for free. So, well, and I mean, businesses need to make money in order to survive. But then at the same time, it's like, but you're like, taking money from from a place where there is none so it's such a hard thing it's like 
how does how do we do this properly and i mean i have no idea yeah the the circumstances have to line up um pretty well for a consumer proposal to work like you need some income it it doesn't uh it doesn't lend like i've run it i my worst case scenario is uh i had a lady once as a client there um and she had and she lived in another city. I won't mention the city for anonymity's sake, but um, she ended up in Edmonton after the fact. And she was in, her boyfriend stole a police car and she was in the police car with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So I've been there, yeah. <laughs> of course, right? Um, how you end up in stand-up comedy. So, um, so, and the police gave chase and he ran the police car into an embankment. I, I know the embankment actually, I've been, like, this is a city I've been to a lot. And then they're sitting there and he says to her, you know, if like, if they pick me up here, I'm going to jail for like, it, you know, this is not something people do as their first offense, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, you know, I'm going back to jail for a long time. And she says, oh, well, switch seats then. So, you know, she switches seats with him. So she's in the driver's seat by the time the cops get there. And she ends up with $200,000 in court fines because of this, right? So the bill for the wrecked police car, they hit a bunch of stuff on route, they damaged the embankment and on and on. You can't bankrupt out of court fines. You so can't. You cannot. So she makes, you know, now she's on social assistance. She's got a child. She makes 1200 bucks a month. And she's got this $200,000 fine. You can't consumer proposal out of it. You can't bankrupt out of it. I have no idea what the solution to this problem is. Like, so, you know, you think about conventional financial planning solutions like consumer proposal or bankruptcy, that would be, you know. Right. A, and those would be a stretch for most financial planners to recommend. I think most financial planners would prefer to see their clients kind of pay off their debt. But even there, that's just a tool that becomes unavailable. Yeah, that's not, you know, that's not remotely possible for anyone in that position unless somehow a job presents itself where, but you're always in this, it's just a never ending cycle of, of not being able to get ahead because it's one step forward, two back, generally speaking, I think. So um, what are your best recommendations to help for, for people? I, you know, I don't even know where to start. So generally the first thing that I like to start with, now it depends on the situation. Some people don't need this, but generally the first thing I do, it's actually not much different than your videos. First off, find something that's relevant to them, a straightforward concept relevant to them to explain. So, you know, if it's like, if they carry credit card debt, we can mm -hmm. talk about, you know, paying off that credit card, one credit card, pick on that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I like to do, if people are carrying some debt that's in collections, I will coach them through and as much as possible, actually be there with them for a call to a collections agent. So that's, I find that's a concrete thing you can do. So sometimes, you know, you'll send somebody away with homework and it depends sometimes on people's availability and timing and a bunch of other questions, but you sort of send somebody away with homework. You say, all right, you're going to call this collections agent. Here's the sort of paths you can take with this. And if you know the collection systems a little bit, you kind of know how the collections agents are going to respond and make a deal with that collections agent. So this debt, this one debt out of the four or five items you have in collections is going to get handled in a way that you can manage um, right so your whole goal with that collection is to have it reduced to a payment that's affordable because they're going to say we would prefer to have this rather than calling you all the time basically right that's the collections agents they're human beings they they don't like are they they they, they are they are uh, gen right. genuinely in my time talking to collections agents i've had one difficult interaction and probably you know 50 good interactions oh that's so, good yeah um and i have a there's a regular podcast listener here who used to be in collections and he'll he'll uh, i think attest to that so well well that's yeah. and then so that's the first step is learning that and i mean i think that you're working towards a goal and you see that happen and then it's easier to hit that next one and next one and it's such yeah. a tough thing because it, yeah, financial planning is such a slow process that we want to happen immediately. Yeah. A lot of times though, it's about that person recognizing that they can do something that will make a difference for their financial future. Right. Because everybody can improve. 
that's it no so, matter how bad of a situation you're in working yeah. towards improving it will improve it yeah that's right that's exactly it it's uh once you yeah, once you can take a step like then the next step is easier mm -hmm. but yeah you're you're right you're not going to solve everything in one meeting you're not going to know that any problems have been solved um, a lot of times it's going to feel like you're talking to dead air so right it's uh, but it is rewarding work i i don't want to suggest that it's not rewarding just sometimes you have to wait a long time to hear you know I, and i just had one of these i just had this this service agency a lady from there reached out to me um maybe a month and a half ago you know she like since we last talked she's had a baby she's paid off some debts like there's all this stuff she she gave me like a yearbook update of her life through the nice. service agency and i like i don't remember specifically what we talked about but it you know it's super rewarding it's just nice to see that that, that at least for her clearly that meant something right for sure well that's awesome so you know what about anybody listening would so that would be your first step would be trying to find information about your credit score looking at what you owe trying to get one of those chopped down to something that uh, is affordable and then going from there you don't generally recommend bankruptcy i remember in class we talked about it saying like sometimes it's just the way Sometimes it's the way. So what I always like to look at here and my sort of thought process around this is if you can get your debts paid off in less than about two years, then that makes more sense than bankruptcy. Once you're past that two year mark, and there's a good tool called undebt.it, I believe it is, might be undebt.io, sorry, but it's either undebt.it or undebt.io. Um, and you can actually plug in all your debts there and build a sort of repayment schedule, it's free. So there's, there's a paid version, but you don't have, there's no reason to pay for it. Um, and I guess they won't be sponsoring, sorry. Um, so <laughs> they, uh, but anyways, it's a good tool. You go through, plug in all your debts and it shows you, it says it'll be this long to repay and you can right. build snowball or you can build an avalanche method, like however you want to do it. It's, it's a really solid tool um, from both a technical and behavioral perspective. And I, so you can go there and Sometimes I would do it with somebody. Sometimes I would send them and they would do it themselves. But if it's less than two years, then to me, bankruptcy generally doesn't make sense. If it's more than two years, at least it's a question you should be asking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, debt free and 30 podcast, which is host. It's a, it's a bankruptcy trustee who hosts it. And he always says like the earlier you call me, like a lot of other things, the, the more problems we can solve. Right, because it's going to get worse the longer yeah. the longer you go on with it, right? Like, yeah, that's it. It's uh, it's this. So it's just like starting now, even though it sucks. Sort of the same thing with all of it, right? Investing yeah. now is going to make your life easier than that's if right. you start five years from now or twenty years from now. Having the conversation uh, now, right? Getting past that shame and having that initial conversation, like it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like so many other things getting started. So. And then, so there would be other, so that's what is your role in the situation. I imagine there's sort of, are there some like government social assist, assistant experts that come in with like, you know, grants and other things that people can apply for? Or, a I know little a bit. Bunch. Yeah, a little bit of that stuff. Um, so the agency will connect people to the appropriate government organizations. And that's highly situational. So, you know, if you have somebody who has, again, the addictions issue, then there's a whole range of government services for that. Somebody with a disability, there's a whole range of government services there. Somebody who's been involved in human trafficking, there's a whole range of services there. So that's where um, you, I, I like the connection with a service agency here because they're gonna know all those other connecting points. I would never know those and I would never get to be an expert in all of that stuff. And, you know, I, I had an example of this just recently here, Kent. Um, there's a fellow by the name of uh, John Stapleton. John does uh, low income for retirement planning through mostly the Toronto Public Library. Um, he's so, and he really lives in that retirement planning on a low income space. Mm -hmm. So when I have a retirement planning question, I'll go to John. Uh, and 
but he just, you know, he did a session recently and he's really good. He'll CC me on emails now with technical questions because he knows where I live and mm -hmm. uh, like mentally. Right. Um, right. And he said, I had a question come up in a session. He emailed it to somebody at actually the Toronto um, housing corporation. And it was this question about how income gets tested against subsidies for housing mm -hmm. right? or how assets get tested against. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a very fine point that comes out in here, but it would be the kind of thing where like even John who lives in that space and deals with that day in and day out, he's got to go to the right person to get that question addressed. And, and, you know, it's a lot of times it's just building a good enough network to know where to go. So, you know, right. it was very normal for me that I would say, like this question came up here and I would go back to the service agency and I would say, here's a question that came up. How do we address it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then in the network, like, you know, I, I know a lot of financial planners at Edmonton. So a lot of times I'm able to get questions answered about, you know, one program or another, but, but a lot of it is like in that situation, just, you know, Google it, find the legislation, find the, the appropriate right. uh, regulations. Like, Unfortunately, there's a million questions that come up and very few of them are in like the CFP textbook or that kind of thing. So. Well, exactly. So it's like, well, how do you know, where do I begin? How do you even know? Because this isn't what's taught, yeah. you know, to us unless unless you have a lot of experience in that space, you wouldn't know because you'd have to learn on the fly. I don't know where else you would figure it out. So, I mean, from from my perspective, perspective that's great thank you for being the first guest and host of of our podcast which should probably be renamed but the, uh, <laughs> the I, I like to see how it works out i think you should wait uh, wait until you see what your um, your first 20 or 25 episodes look like and then you can right i mean who knows it may change and i mean um but i you know thank you so much for what you do for financial planners and for everybody in this space and uh and uh good to see good people doing good things for people and we're all there's a lot of people out there that are looking to help and and first thing i guess is for people to ask for help which is which is the toughest part 100 um, yeah thanks thanks for doing this kent i really appreciate it appreciate the opportunity it's uh it's nice to be able to um uh, expound a little bit so thank you yeah no absolutely I, I look always look forward to chatting with you um if you want to learn anything listen to jason he's he's the best teacher out there that i know if you want monotone slow teaching come to me and i'll give you partial truths <laughs> i think we do substantially different things though kent like your videos are really good to that public education front which i will never be good at so no, that's, yeah, that is the point. Easy. They don't need yeah. to learn the math. Perfect. But right. thank you very much. And thanks for all the names for, uh, I wouldn't even know where to start if, if you didn't put us in touch with all the people that we're going to interview moving forward that are working in more specific parts of the space. So thanks again, Jason. I look forward to giving a listen. Thanks so much, Kent. Have a great one. You too. Thanks. Okay. The number four this episode is seven. The number for this episode is seven. And I want to correct something in there. I had said Bridge House is a, a mutual fund uh, asset manager. That's not correct. They're in the asset management space, but really what they do is provide a fantastic suite of tools for financial advisors to interact with their clients. They were a leader in getting the trusted contact person um, process in place. I first heard them talk about that maybe in 2017 or thereabouts. So quite a while ago. And I will actually include a link in the show notes to their wheel of investor emotion. This is something I show in class. It's a great resource. Um, and it talks about the relationship between the frequency of looking at your investment accounts and how happy you are likely to be with that outcome. And I think that it's uh, probably fairly intuitive what the result is here. I would suggest it's worth having a look. So just click in the show notes uh, on the Bridge House wheel of investor emotion. All right, thanks very much. And I hope you'll join us again in two weeks time when I'll be talking to Aaron. Aaron and I are gonna chat about the new first time home savers account. Um, Aaron overall is one of the most technically proficient financial planners in the country. So 
I look forward to that conversation. Thanks very much and enjoy your continued studies. And the object for today's interview is um, this little stuffed panda, a stuffed panda. This is the, actually curiously, the very first thing, this little panda that uh, I bought my wife as a gift when we were still dating. Um, so there you go, that's a long time ago. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits and you'll have access to our full library of content.